G'day everyone. Um, this is my focusing tutorial video. Um, some friends on Twitter were curious about my routine uh, for focus and so I'm happy to put this together. Unfortunately it did take a little bit of time but um, we'll get there in the end. So today all going well we'll find some things that I do hopefully will help you with your imaging. Um, the way I look at my planetary imaging in general is just to minimise all the obstacles and conditions that will degrade my images and focusing is right up there at the top of that list. It's about being ready to take advantage of good conditions when they arise uh, because one or two captures in good seeing can make all the difference. If you're having trouble finding correct focus you can miss the opportunity to get those good seeing bits and um, it, it really can make a difference on a nice image. Um, I'll put a satin GIF in here in the video uh, just to show you how quickly things can degrade. Um, this was shot over 14 minutes, eight different captures over 14 minutes and it basically went from reasonable seeing to just off the end of it, you could barely tell it was satin by the end of it and for the next three quarters of an hour, my Jupiter work was crap as well. So we just basically binned that night. So if you're ready to take advantage of good conditions, that can be um, the best way. So it's very tricky to get focusing right, especially in average seeing conditions. Uh, in good conditions, everything about planetary becomes easy. Uh, finding focus to processing, final results, the whole lot is just seems like it's easy. You don't need to chase it at all, it just happens. Um, unfortunately, good conditions are hard to come by and if they're around all the time, we'll probably be less of us trying to do it because it's a really good feeling when you get some good images and you um, know you're going to get some good uh, seeing. Um, a quick list of things I try and run through before imaging on my nights. Um, I'll basically, even before I know what I'm going to look for, I'll, I'll plan my nights out using um, what the jet stream's doing. So windy.com is the one I use mostly and I just look at what the wind's doing and more specifically in the range of 7 to 10 to 11,000 metres. Um, it can be not uncommon for 200 plus k an hour winds up in that area and it really does turn your seeing into soup. Um, uh, having a look at what is, is going to come on that night it will just give you a better understanding, uh, not to stop you going out there and having a look, but um, if I know that there's winds up there above 200 k an hour or I'm not going to go and set up for 45 minutes, get ready and get everything going with that in raging above. Um, if I had an observatory, I'd definitely run out and I'd go and um, uh, take some captures and see what it has. But as far as setting up for three quarters of an hour and letting it cool down and everything, I just won't do it. So have an understanding of what your jet stream's doing in your area above your conditions. Um, I always ensure that the scope's cooled down to ambient temperature before I start my serious images. Um, often when it's cooling down, I'll just muck around at native focal length of about 1800 uh, millimetres. So it doesn't really matter if everything's not perfect because the size of the planets and everything is, you can't really tell that things aren't perfect. So, but the more you zoom in, the more you need it to be perfect or not, better. You know, you need you need to minimise those those issues as we talk about. Um, uh, have I collimated the scope? I'll when I put it together at the front, I'll give it a light collimation, but once I wait for it to cool down. Then before I put it, put the, um, the two hundred, like the, the normal image train in there, I will collimate it again properly. Uh, like I said, while it cools down, things do move around, and I'll um, uh, make sure it's right to go when it's right to go. A few weeks ago, I had a bit of a, a, a fail, 
and for 30 minutes I just wasted because some I did something on the collimation and I just got no idea. But anyway, 30 minutes wasted of the night. So it can happen and it does happen. Um, uh, what's your planets doing? What's the elevation of your planets? Um, are you shooting below 45 degrees um, in RGB without an ADC? Because this will severely hamper your ability to focus accurately. Um, and the final results just won't be there. Um, do you have heavy colour fringing, uh, red and blue on either side of the, the planet? Um, it's, it's, if you do have that, you need to look at an ADC. Um, if you're getting started, do you actually have a filter on the front of the camera? Like if you're just in, getting into the, the hobby of planetary imaging, make sure you have yourself a, an RGB, like a, a white light filter or an IR filter, whatever. But um, because across the spectrum from blue to IR, which is no filter, um, you all of those different light points focus to a different point. So you're not going to be able to get a good focus um, without a filter on the front of your camera. Um, if your target's elevation is lower down in the sky, just temper your expectations because you're not going to be able to get a really sharp image of something if you're um, only shooting at 25 or 30 degrees. Um, there is an inherent softness that you can't get away from shooting that low down. Um, and on the screen, this will also play out that you, you will see that on the screen and it will hinder your ability to focus properly. Um, the better images will maybe look to use um, far lower frame stacks in that instead of um, stacking two and a half thousand out of ten thousand or four thousand out of ten thousand they might only stack 500 frames just to really capture that better amount of seeing or they may even um, shoot in um, IR synthetic green and a blue uh, I'll put a, a picture up here on the screen and it's my Mars image from I think it's the third of December and I just pulled that apart and made a synthetic image. So I took my old RGB image, I pulled the blue channel out of it. I had the IR channel because I shot color and then IR for that night. So I blended those two and made a synthetic green and then I put them back together telling Winjupo said it was blue was blue, IR was red and the blend was green so it gave me the colours and you can see the colours aren't too bad um, but that literally took me five minutes so some guys actually do that when they're um, shooting and it's not something I do but it definitely does work. Um, are the conditions that poor that you probably best shoot uh, using the infrared for the night? It's a legitimate solution. Um, while it's good to see details and stuff like that on the planets um, and, and they do look good but they just don't look as good as the RGB um, shooting in RGB so I tend to do less of it but with the 24 I may definitely uh, do more, a lot more of it um, because it might be troublesome to try and get decent seeing above 10,000 millimetre focal length just with RGB, um, infrared light is de it deteriorates a lot less through the atmosphere when shooting. So that may be an option that I move towards. It's not something I do at the moment. Um, even exception, exceptional images will um, be unable to repeat the sharpness of images shot at 30 degrees compared to when they're at 60 degrees. Um, I'll put a couple of satin images up on the screen and I'm under no illusion that when Saturn moves closer to the north as it's starting to do, that in a couple of years' time that I'll be able to repeat the sharpness of these images um, going forward. So 
we'll just see how it pans out. Okay. Understand your expectations on your images when you're shooting at different elevations. Um, you can focus, getting to the, the, the reason for the video, you can focus by hand to a reasonable effect. Um, and especially if you're shooting at focal lengths below 2000 millimeters, where the absolute focus is not that critical. Um, but at longer focals, when you, when you get longer focal lengths up around four, five, six, eight thousand, you need to really be on your game with your focusing. Um, when you touch the scope at focal lengths at six thousand millimeters, it doesn't stop shaking for four or five, six, seven seconds. It, it does that. So then you're left to work, work out whether it's the bump you did or your adjustment or the seeing that has created the new look to your image. You don't know whether it's your scope is now shaking or the seeing is, it's a bit of a, um, a technical problem. So the correct focus is an obvious necessity in this hobby and a motorized focuser is, is 100% one of those things that will improve your imaging. And it is, I, I will guarantee that for you. Um, if you don't have one and think about purchasing one, trust me, on average you will have better results with a motorized focuser if you're currently using your hand to focus for your images. Um, for me, the equatorial platform and a motorized focuser were the biggest parts of improvement to my imaging and I saw the benefit immediately. Um, it was just night and day. It just, it just you always seem to found, find focus, whereas other days you'll be out there and you might miss it slightly. And, and yeah, 100% it, it, it will improve your imaging. Um, it will also allow you to be ready for those captures. If you're always in focus or close to, you will be ready when the skies, are, the, the seeing improves. Um, one capture in focus is better than 20 out of focus obviously even when i put the motorized focuser on the scope i was thinking about do i take it off when i use the scope for visual and take it out with the kids or whatever but after the first time using it with the motorized focuser doing visual it's even better for using um for for doing visual because you no longer have to worry about is the other person is that focused for the other person you give them the um the hand controller and just tell them to press the either button there's only two buttons one either way and then you will um, find focus they, they can do it so much easier than turning a knob up there that they're unfamiliar with the focuser on my 16 inch is just the cheap skywatcher mechanical focuser and it does the job great um, it's all you need some of you may have seen that I've bought the zoo uh, ZWO electronic focuser for the 24 and I think I'll probably need that because I'm going to be trying to shoot above 10,000 millimeters this next coming year which will need to be fine-tuned um, it will make a difference um, and if you focus without touching your scope you will immediately find a benefit um, when I'm in the act of focusing you may hit the perfect spot the first time out. You may just bang, you're on it, but you won't know that it's the perfect spot unless you go back and forward past focus. So that's basically my routine involves me going back and forward knowingly past the best average, working out where the best average point of focus is. Uh, I always do this four or five times and I go way past in either direction and then I can see where the best average spot is. If you only do it a, a couple of times, you may it, it may be the scene that you affects your image and you may not understand where that sweet spot is. Um, yeah, going I go well past on either side. And then I will narrow it down right over, I'll come back to a certain area and then I will go three or four adjustments either side of that, either side of that spot. And I'll continue to do that for another five or ten times. I'll just go 
one, two, three, one, two, three, back the other way, one, two, three, four, and I will just hammer that, that last little bit of focus until I know that I've got the best one. Um, you, you will see a pattern, and um, I can also, I'll put up a clip now, and I'll show you, uh, your eye will allow you to see when it's in focus. We watch this clip, you can see that the frames, it looks to be good and in focus, but if we stop this clip, we stop it a couple of different times, you can see that each frame that you stop on, it's crap. But when you string them all together, your eye will determine the right spot and it, and it works really well. Always trust yourself and your eye to be accurate. You'll be surprised how good um, your judgment is when, you, when you're looking at it. Um, take your time to do it. As I said, one capture in focus is far better than 20 out. And do it every 20 or 30 minutes or when you feel like you need to refocus. Go back and do that same routine. Back and forward past an acceptable looking area and then fine tune down around that area back and forward. Um, if you're using fire capture, make sure you use the things built in to help with fire capture. Put a couple of slides up on the screen. Um, the focusing aid tool um, this is really good. If you check this box, it will center the planet and make sure that it doesn't move. It just uh, continues. There'll, there'll be no fluctuation and moving. So your eye doesn't have to chase the planet around the screen at all. It just stays there. So that really helps with you being able to determine areas of contrast. Um, Another area uh, that fire capture can really help you is there's a screen adjustment button. It's up the top here in the center. I'll put this other um, screenshot up. And all of the changes you do here to create more contrast on the planet and, and help you focus aren't reflected on the captures. This just adjusts the screen of your computer to help with the focus. So you, you can get your screen to look superb so you can find that extra focus spot and but it's only the screen that this adjustment will affect. So that's a really good tool as well. Um, for targets with the moon, find areas of um, like shadow. I enjoy imaging the moon in shadow because it really brings a bit of depth yeah, but if you don't have shadows and areas of high contrast, try and look at the ridge lines on the nearest crater in your image or depending on how far you are, maybe the, the edge of the moon. But I always um, look at the, the crater edges and the shadows that are cast for uh, best focus there. Venus is pretty bland, but uh, obviously just focus on that bright edge of the planet um, it is, it's basically your only tool, but again, back and forward, back and forward, past, and try and work out the best average spot, and then hammer that last best average spot. Um, Mars, look for the structures on the planet, they really are quite um, dark, and they are the best, the albedo markings on the planet, they're the best to target with Mars and they really do a good job of letting you um, find a, a, good, um, a good focus spot. Um, Jupiter is the same, structures on the belt and try and find uh, something that is, again, contrast driven. The moons are a good, if, if they're close by, they're a good item that will get you into that rough spot so you can start with the focus on the moon and get you in that, that fine tuning area, but then always try and use the planet for the, the best fine tuning um, of your focus. Um, Saturn, Saturn's the Cassini division. It's, it's by far the easiest and best way to do it. Again, um, 
with us at the moment, like it's up around 60 or so, and it's so it's really is easy. But when you're shooting it down in the, the 20s and 30s and, and stuff like that, like some of our northern hemisphere friends are doing, you really need to have an ADC on that, otherwise, it'll look like soup all day long. Like it, it, it really uh, will make um, uh, focusing difficult. Uranus and Neptune, um, I've been told over the years, like I haven't been able to image them that much, but uh, focusing on a star next to them is, is more, uh, is easier than focusing on the planet itself. Um, but if you don't have a star close by, again, just try and use um, the, the tools available on Fire Capture or your capture software to um, make it easier for you to to do that. Um, that's, that's about it. Overall, it's about finding a routine that works for you and your setup. Um, I hope I've answered uh, a few of your questions. If not, leave some comments down below and I'll try and get back to you and help out more. Oh, I'm happy to answer questions down there in um, in the comments. What else have I got here? Yeah, that's about it. I don't think I've missed anything. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.